have all y'all out there. Hallelujah. We, uh, I noticed uh, my wife and I, we went, went out with another couple. We went and watched Meg 2 yesterday. It's a shark movie, so it's very spiritual. Very spiritual. I actually got sad when the sharks... I'm not... When one of them died... I got a little got a little misty eyed, didn't I? It's, it's fact. It's a fact. But uh, um, but I noticed there were some folks wearing shark shirts today, and uh, uh, you're welcome. I mean, we're we're elevating our spiritual game here, people. This is this is good. This is good. Uh, we're trying to get rid of them orange cows, and uh, we're we're getting there. We're getting there. So turn with me if you would in your Bibles, Genesis chapter thirty two. This morning's message is entitled, Walking with the Limp. This message today is geared towards Jane Crowell, Angel Callan, Sam Caldwell, and Anthony Marshall. So, for a slight fee, you can have a sermon preached at somebody. And, uh, and if your name gets called out to be preached at for a slight fee, I'll tell you who it was. <laughs> So, Woo. my I work I, I work in that spiritual gift of aggravation. It, it God has blessed me. You know I, I'm I'm really anointed. So when when natural man comes in contact with supernatural God. Do you understand that supernatural God is going to overwhelm every time? Uh, it's There's always going to be a change that takes place. And it's meant to be that way. It's meant that when God is in the house, that, that God's going to be in charge. God's going to have His way. God wants to have His way. You have to allow Him to have His way. But when natural and supernatural collide, the supernatural is going to overwhelm. And, and that's the way it was meant to be. God wants to do that. And the changes in us become our new normal that we needed all along. I don't know about you, but I'm glad God accepted me for who I was when He found me. But I'm even more happy that He changed me from what I was to become something better. Is anybody with me on that? I'm glad I'm not who I used to be. And some of y'all, I'm glad y'all ain't what y'all used to be. Especially when I hear some stories. And I hear some stories. So, sometimes though, that, that, that growth place where the supernatural comes in and overwhelms the natural and, and it causes us to grow, it causes us to be stretched, uh, it creates a, a growing process and improvements in us. It's not always a pleasant opportunity. Sometimes it hurts. Sometimes it doesn't feel good. But I'm thankful that my God doesn't waste my pain. God does something good. So, in thinking about these Maui fires that have been happening and uh, uh, taking place, and I was, I was combing through the internet, and uh, I came across this article uh, from the National Geographic in July of 22, and it was talking about fires. And it said that uh, in the year 2019, Smokey Bear turned 75 years old. I remember old Smokey. Yeah. And uh, I always called him Smokey the Bear. Is anybody with me on that? I mean, you got to have a V in there, not Smokey Bear. It's about to sound like he burned up. The, but Smokey, so I'm going to call him Smokey the Bear. It, so when I was in Poe in Arkansas, I was I was a uh, part of the volunteer fire department there, and it served also as a chaplain for them. And we'd have uh, fire prevention week uh, at the beginning of the school year in September, and uh, we'd set up a smoke house and filled with smoke so kids learn how to crawl on their hands and knees through the smoke. And we would show up with our respirators on, you know, full turnouts and everything, so kids wouldn't be afraid. You know, like ah, Darth Vader, you know. They would, they would, it, it would scare them, but they would, they would, you know, we're good people, come to us so we can save you. And uh, uh, we had, because we were, where we were situated was 
national forest land right there. And so Smokey the Bear is a federal uh, um, sort of a, uh, an advertising icon of the U.S. Forest Service. And uh, so we had a Smokey the Bear costume. One you slip on, it's a big, bulky, hairy thing with a big old head that sits down, and, and it was just my size. <laughs> and wouldn't you know, I'm, I'm the smallest guy in the fire department, and it was just my size. And so I had to put that thing on, and it had a fan in the head, and there was this metal box, and that metal box sat right on top of my head, and the fan didn't work. And it hurt. And after a couple different times of wearing that, I was like grabbing T-shirts and stuffing them in there. So I, you know, because that was kind of, but it was hot, 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 hot. So me and Smokey go way back. We go, we go way back. And uh, Smokey the Bear, I remember growing up uh, as a kid, only you can prevent wildfires, you know, and that sort of thing. You know, you heard him right there. You heard his voice in your head. Those of you that are old enough to remember. But he was always encouraging visitors, campers, you know, don't be stupid. <laughs> you know, you're an idiot. Don't do that. You know, that's not what he said, but should have. Wildfires are destructive forces, and, and wildfires are the result from natural causes like lightning. Nature sets its own fire. It happens by accident because of a thrown cigarette or a campfire or, or dragging a chain down the road. If that's you, stop it. <laughs> Don't come down Stillman Valley Road dragging your chain with the south wind blowing because I'll be homeless. So, But then there's also deliberate acts of arson. People just are ridiculous that way. Despite Smokey's campaign and to prevent wildfires, uh, uh, wildfires burned about 10 million acres of land in 2017. 2017. Burned 10 million acres. And then in 2018, I remember a thing called the campfire. There was a, there was a wildfire that was started by a campfire, and they just called it the campfire. And it destroyed nearly <clears throat> 20,000 structures, killed more than 80 people, and the insurance losses topped 10 billion. How do you understand that the Maui fire is worse than the campfire? And the campfire was bad. The Maui fire is worse. So while you know, looking at these fires and the detriment and the losses they cause, while and it, 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 they're frightening and there's a lot of consequences that come with these fires, they dominate the news headlines. Fire actually has positive sides as well, besides just keeping you warm. But forest fires, of all things, actually have a positive to it. Controlled use of wildland fires for positive environmental effects is common around the world. That's not an American thing. It happens everywhere. And it might seem counterintuitive uh, uh, that a fire which burns plant life and endangers animals and things like that, that it could promote, you know, like an ecological health uh, for the land. But a fire is a natural phenomenon and the nature has kind of developed itself in its way to accept that presence. It does happen. So a lot of uh, ecosystems benefit from being cleared out. If you've ever walked through the woods and there's just, well, not here, but when you walk in a real forest and there's a lot of leaves, there's a lot of dead trees. There's a lot of limbs that are down. And all that stuff covers the ground. And it prevents other things from growing up on the forest floor. And uh, uh, it just it makes a mess. And some of that stuff needs to be cleared out. It needs to be burned off. Uh, matter of fact, some plant and animal populations require fire just in order to survive. Um, fire increases fertility in the soil. Uh, farmers have known that for years. They burn off their fields. It turns into ash. It enriches the soil, and they're able to plant again. My wife and I, uh, we had we had red oak and white oak trees, and we had leaves. We literally had leaves up to here, and so it, it looked like snowdrifts when you. It, so in, instead of trying to rake them all up, we just burnt the field, burn our, our yard up. And uh, got it away from the house, got it away from the trees, uh, poured on the lighter fluid, turned it loose. And, and it just, because our house went on a slope, 
we started uphill because it just felt like gravity pulls fire down. It doesn't, but it just felt good doing that anyway. So we would burn it off, and it's a black yard, and then it rains, and, and pretty soon we got a green yard. I mean a very green yard, and our neighbors started noticing it, so they started doing the same thing. And, uh, but it, So there's benefit to it. Several plants actually require uh, fire to move along in their life cycles, like a pine tree. The pine tree seed is in the pine cone, and some species of pine, that there's such a heavy tar on the pine cone, it takes the fire to actually release it so the seed comes out. You wouldn't have new trees if it wasn't for the fire. Interesting. Uh, other plants and flowers like certain types of lilies actually use fire for seed germination. I did not know that. And while it seems like, you know, you have a big old fire, a lot of animals are going to die, it's actually that, that uh, animal casualties are really low because they either burrow in the ground or they do what people don't do. They get out of there. <laughs> so on, on one hand, it's dangerous, but on the other hand, fires get rid of an ecosystem of stuff that needs to be cleared out even invasive species kind of like uh, uh, um, bugs that come in uh, certain plants that come in anybody ever heard of kudzu that stuff just takes over and uh, so some of this stuff that hasn't adapted to fire resistance uh, it actually is healthy because it comes through and wipes all those things out so when nature is confronted with fire there's going to be reaction and the resulting changes can actually be good. They can actually be good. Now I want us to look at Genesis chapter 32. This is the story of Jacob. Jacob and his brother Esau. Jacob had deceived his brother, got the birthright. This is later on in life. They're adults. Jacob has come home. He's trying to make peace with his brother and his brother's already said, I'm going to kill you. And so he's, he's trying to make peace, do the right thing. He comes back over to the land, and uh, this is where we pick up. He's there with his family and his brothers down the road heading his way. So in Genesis 32, starting in verse 22, it says, During the night Jacob got up and he took his two wives, his two servant wives and his eleven sons, and crossed the Jabbok River with them. After taking them to the other side, he sent over all his possessions. This left Jacob all alone in the camp. And a man came and wrestled with him until the dawn began to break. When the man saw that he could not win the, uh, the match, he touched Jacob's hip and wrenched it out of its socket. Then the man said, Let me go, for the dawn is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go until you bless me. That's the weirdest thing I've ever heard. I'm getting mugged, I'm fighting the mugger, and the mugger tells me to let him go, and I said, not until you bless me. Some of y'all, I mean, you read this, and it just kind of goes in one eye and out the other. Does anybody see how ludicrous that statement is? Mugger mugs me and I'm wrestling with him and he says, let me go. I'm saying, not until you give me your money. <laughs> I want your watch. But I didn't, I didn't say that. Hallelujah. So, I will, he says, I will not let you go until you bless me. What is your name, the man said. And he replied, my name is Jacob. Your name is no longer going to be Jacob, the man told him. From now on you will be called Israel because you have fought with God and with men and have won. Well, please tell me your name, Jacob said. Why do you want to know my name, the man replied. Then he blessed Jacob right there. And Jacob named the place Peniel, which means face of God, for he said, I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been spared. There we get the idea of who he was actually wrestling. Wasn't a man. The sun was rising as Jacob left Peniel, and he was limping because of the injury to his hip. Even today, the people of Israel don't eat the tendon near the hip socket because of what happened that night when the man strained the tendon of Jacob's hip. It's a pretty interesting story here. And when I was reading this story, and it, it what came of note to me is he says, your name is no longer 
Jacob, I'm going to call you Israel. And for a lot of us, you would think Israel means the people of God. But that's not what Israel means. The name Israel literally means one who struggles with God. There is a nation and a people group called the people who struggle with God. This is literally the story of a man who's fighting his inner demons, he's fighting his older brother, and now he's fighting God. Have you know he's got a tall list of folk he's getting on the wrong side of? And it made me think when I saw this, Israel literally meaning one who struggles with God. Have you ever struggled with God? If you have not, you're A, very sheltered and innocent, praise the Lord, or B, you a liar. A long time ago, I learned that God lets me vent. God has big shoulders. And you can vent to Him. And I vented at God. I vented at God. I, rah, 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 rah. I mean, getting it all out. Might have even shook my finger. Got it all out. There was no lightning. There was no storms blew in and I turned into a pillar of salt or anything like that. That didn't happen. But once I got it all out, I'm standing there at a literally a playground. It was at night, went for a walk. I'm at a at a playground in the middle of the night in Waxahachie, Texas, just giving God the walk for us because I'm really frustrated because 20-year-old Mike Sullivan knows better than Jesus Christ. And I got done, and I mean I wore out. I mean, I I was literally talking out. I mean, <laughs> they would have come with the butterfly nets if they if somebody had seen me. I was letting God have it, and I got done, and I just stood there for a second trying to catch my breath. And and you could just hear God so heavily in my mind. God said, You done? I just put my head down. I was like, Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I got nothing left to say. He said, okay. Now make it right. God, I'm sorry. He said, it's okay, son. Because I love you. And you can vent to me anytime. But if you vent to me, then you better take time to listen to me. Come on, is somebody here now? God wants to talk to you. But He wants you to tell Him. He wants you to get it all out. Have I struggled with God? Yes, I've struggled with God. And the reality is, as all of us have. Another truth is that God expects it. Mind-blowing. God expects it. Why? Because you're human. You're human. God expects you're going to have questions. God expects that there's going to be frustrations. God expects you're not going to understand. And by George, you're a smart individual. You're a good cookie. And you know stuff. And God should talk to you before He does anything. Have you married somebody like that? Don't raise your hand. We are prone to natural behavior which looks nothing like spiritual behavior. And it causes us, uh, and spiritual behavior would actually cause us to act and look more like God. But we don't act in a spiritual nature all the time, do we? I don't have my glasses on so I can't see your faces. You can give me an ugly look all you want. I'm preaching anyway. When the natural behavior overgrowth is getting out of control. God sends a supernatural firestorm to help make things right again. Now I'm not telling you that everything bad in your life God caused. <laughs> you did plenty of it. Okay? People did plenty of it. But I'll tell you, when God knows you need, you get a little too comfortable, He allows things to go on in your life. Versus God doing this at you, and this at you, this is what God does. 
Alright, you going to be off on your own? You going to be independent? You going to be stupid? God doesn't say stupid. Yes, He does. God says stupid. You going to act like that? Now what does the Bible say? I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Meaning, swap you for somebody else. God will never do that. God doesn't leave. What does God do? He pulls His hand back. <laughs> and He lets you. Go ahead. You're going to make that bed. You're going to sleep in it. I'm right here. Call on me when you need me. But I'm going to let you go through it. Why? Because there's too much overgrowth in your life. And if you're not going to listen to me, then I'm going to let you live it. You see, Jacob in the Bible was strong-willed. He was self-sufficient. His name meant deceiver. His literal name meant deceiver. But that wasn't what God wanted for him. That wasn't how God wanted him to live. That's not how He wanted him to, to have a legacy. God wanted something else for Jacob, but Jacob couldn't see that because he was all up in his natural while the supernatural was saying, Son, i got a better life for you. i got a better plan for you. As a matter of fact, it has less regret, less hurt, and a whole lot better happiness and joy to it. You can't deceive your way into a good life. You can't work yourself into a good life. I love how stubborn some of y'all are. But I'm telling you, you cannot pull up your own boots by your own bootstraps sometimes. So the Lord arranged a night for Jacob to wrestle with this mysterious opponent who eventually touched Jacob's hip and caused him to limp for the rest of his life. That's what scholars believe that this was something that he did for the rest of his life. And Jacob had been relying on his own physical strength and his own mind instead of God. Oh, wait a minute. That sounds like a lot of modern day Christians. See, we can't throw rocks at the people in the Bible <laughs> when, when we're guilty. I'm not going to look at you. When we're guilty of doing the same thing. Wow, look at them. Them rascally Hebrews. The, them, them Old Testament no-gooders. And we're no better. It's easy to point a finger without doing some self-examination. I love how you're shouting with me right now. I must be hitting, hitting a target there. But Jacob was relying on himself and not God. And so his limp, that limp that he got not only led to his surrender, but it was also a physical uh, uh, reminder of his struggle against God. He remembered on that day, something changed in my life. I no longer walk the same. I no longer live the same. Jacob never again tried to scheme his way into God's blessings because that's what he did by stealing the birthright from his brother. He was scheming against his brother and for birthright that's given by God through the Father. He was trying, are you seeing this? He was trying to steal a spiritual blessing. And do you understand, the natural man cannot make God do anything. It's like owning a cat. You can't make that cat do anything. Did I compare God to a cat? Oh, Jesus. I'm sorry. Forgive me. Mm. But Jacob, again, he never tried to scheme his way into the things of God because he learned his lesson and he realized something's got to be different. Instead, he trusted on God. He depended on God. And because of that, he was blessed more after he became Israel than anything he was when he was Jacob. His life got better through surrender. And our temporary lives seem to be a series of dealing with problems. As soon as one hurdle is overcome, we got another hurdle in front of us. Can I tell you, that's just life. Oh, I'm tired of all this, Brother Mike. Well, listen, I get tired of it too, but that's life. There will always be challenges in life. And yet through every obstacle, if we're letting God lead us, our faith is refined. Our life is refined. The supernatural comes in and starts putting that natural down and we're becoming more like God and less like ourselves. We learn about God. And that's why man was primarily created was to have a, a, a personal relationship with God. You weren't made 
in, in spite of what some of y'all think. You weren't made to go fishing. You were made to go hunting. You weren't made to do this thing or that thing or that thing. You may enjoy doing it, but you were made to have a relationship with God. And your life makes no sense apart from God. Apart from God, you're a butter knife trying to act like a screwdriver. That would make a good sermon. Remind me of that. You're trying to become something you're not. God made you that natural man to come into the supernatural presence and fit like this. So if you're looking for the presence of God, He'll make sure you find Him. You hear me? If you're looking for God, you're going to find Him. But if you're too busy for God or the things of God, God will come find you. And I'm not talking about just in this mean, like, I hear Jaws music, it's Jesus! Ah! You know? God's not coming to attack you. He's going to come find you, though. Why? Because He loves you. And He's crazy about you. And He misses you. And even, let's bring this to a close here. Even if it means we now walk with the limp, we are better for having been changed by the supernatural presence of God. We are better for it. Brother Mike, I got a limp now. I'm not the same. Guess what? You're not the same when you go to Walmart for Black Friday. You got scars on your body and on your heart. And you deserve it. We go through life and we're not the same. How many have kids? You ain't the same. Mamas, you ain't the same. Your, your body changes, but your heart is no longer the same. Your thinking is no longer the same. You get married, you're no longer the same. Happy wife, happy life. Can I get a witness? Happy husband. There's not a saying. You say, happy husband. <laughs> we'll see about that. <laughs> you know? Happy husband. What you been doing? <laughs> Why are you happy? <laughs> You're not allowed to be happy. I didn't give you permission. We're never the same. Life just makes us no longer the same. Are you hearing me? I would rather no longer be the same because God is with me than me trying to run from God. Me trying to live apart from God. Don't wait to receive a debilitating limp before you submit to Him and receive His blessings. Don't wait for that. Just come to God. Matter of fact, in Ephesians 3.20 it says, the Lord is able to do immeasurably more than you could ask or you could imagine according to His power that is already at work inside of us. God can do great things. Why? Because He's already here. The supernatural is already here. So suddenly you can pray and things happen. You can rebuke the devil and he'll leave. You can pray over people and their bodies can get healed. Have you know the supernatural still exists? Because God still exists. And whenever God is in the house, the natural takes the back seat. And that's the way it ought to be. When you surrender your heart and your mind and will to the Lord, amazing things happen. So here's what I want to do this morning. I'm going to pray for a couple different folk here today. Number one, if you do not know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you need to. And you can. You can. God is not sitting there with His tally sheet saying, mm -hmm, come on, you got stuff you need to answer for. You know what? When you come to Jesus Christ and get forgiven, it's like you got away with something. It really is. Because your sins are gone. And you will find your best life is on the other side of having struggled with God. When you say, alright God, I'm no longer going to fight you. I want to be with you. And if you're here today and you do not know Jesus as your Savior, we're going to give you an opportunity to know Him. 
And the other thing that I'm going to pray for you for is are you in a place where you you love God, but you're not sure you trust Him? Come on, that's... We could trust God for the little things, but what, what happens when it's life or death? What happens when it's big things? I'm telling you, your God can do anything. But He can't make you do nothing. He comes from a place of surrender. So bow your heads with me right now if you would. You're here today and you'd say, Brother Mike, I do not. I don't, I don't know God as my Savior. I, 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 or I've gotten away from Him. I, I, I just know right now things are not right between me and God. And I want them to be. Because I want you to hear this. God wants them to be. God does not like you being a stranger. He created you to be His child. And He loves you. Regardless of anything you've said or done, God loves you. It doesn't even matter what you did last night. God loves you. And He wants you to know that. And He wants you to... He knows you're not perfect, but He also says you can't stay the way you are. Come to me. Come to me. We'll make things right. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I want to pray for you this morning. I want to know who I need to pray for. You're here today and you say, Lord, come on church, pray with me right now. If you're here today and you say, Lord, I need you as my Savior and I want you today, with every head bowed, would you just slip up a hand real quick? I want to pray for you. Thank you. Thank you. There's somebody else. Thank you. Thank you. Hallelujah. Thank you. Praise God. Praise God. I would tell you right now, your God is not rejecting you. Your God is loving you. As a matter of fact, it makes His Father heart happy. So right now with every head bowed, and church, you'd pray this prayer with me. Come on, let's do it. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. I've done it on my own. And I made a mess of it. Forgive me. Wash me clean. And help me to live for you. I don't want to be independent. I want to trust you. Put the people in my life that will help me. I choose you today, Lord. To be my Savior. And I love you. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you're here and you prayed that prayer for the first time or first time in a long time, I would tell you right now, the Bible says that heaven, heaven is having a party. Because God celebrates when His children come home. And I want to tell you, if that's you, I want you to be able to find me or one of these prayer people we're going to have up here at the front. Come by and let them know that's you today. Because I tell you, you need to be in God's Word. You need to be talking to God like a friend talks to a friend. And you need to be in church because we do this better together. But while every head is bowed right now, I want to ask my prayer people to go ahead and come on up. You're here today and you'd say, Brother Mike, I'm going through some hard hard things and, and I'm tired of being stubborn. I'm tired of being stubborn. I need help trusting God. I need help believing that He's going to be here for me. And Lord God, I pray right now for everybody in this room. You know who we are. You know what we deal with. And God, I just pray right now that You would help us to trust You. Help us to rely on You. Help us to be a people of God. That Lord, let Your supernatural come in. And like a fire, burn out the things that don't need to be there because we trust You. Because I know that Lord God, whenever something changes in my life, it will be for the better. God, I pray, help us to get past our stubbornness to a place of being tender before You. When supernatural God meets natural man, the supernatural is always going to win. So Lord, help us to be okay with it. Help us to expect it. Help us to want it. 
And that, Lord God, you would have your way in our lives today. And Father, we thank you in Jesus' name. Stand with me, if you would, across this place. You already walk with the limp. You've gone through addictions, divorces, bad relationships, bad jobs, bad kids. You've been through it. You already walk with the limp. Let that limp draw you closer to God. Let your circumstances draw you closer to God and not into a hole with yourself. You're better with God on your side. So I want to believe right now that God's doing a good thing in somebody's life today. Again, if you receive Jesus as your Savior, come by and let one of these know because we want to connect with you. We're going to dismiss in just a moment. And those of you that want, you've been dealing with this. The sermon's hitting home. Would you come and let one of these, while we're dismissing, come and let one of these right here pray with you. It is our joy and privilege to be able to take time and just take your things to God because it matters to each one of us. Okay, Don't forget all the things we got going on uh, uh, this week. A lot of stuff happening. Uh, those of you that are going to get baptized, if you'll just hang around uh, a little bit later uh, and, and I'll talk with you. Right now, I'm going to ask Mr. Anthony Marshall if he would, brother. Would you dismiss us in a word of prayer?